It's 7 o'clock. This is Sky News Breakfast. These are our top stories this morning. <laughs> Police under fire. Officers accused of being heavy-handed in breaking up a South London vigil for Sarah Everard, with the Met Commissioner facing a call to resign. A sombre evening turned to anger and protest, with clashes breaking out between police and those in attendance. The Met has defended its actions. Police must act for people's safety. This is the only responsible thing to do. The pandemic is not over. Also ahead, child gun crime. A Sky News investigation reveals more than 600 children were arrested for firearms offences last year, with the youngest just 12 years old. The Metropolitan Police's War Crimes Unit launches an investigation into Asma al-Assad, the British-born wife of the Syrian president. Northern Ireland's Air Ambulance tells Sky News it's seen an upturn in mental health emergencies during the pandemic. In the sport, all roads lead to Paris for Wales as they stay on course for a Six Nations Grand Slam. It's a morning of false promise for most, bright and sunny, but it's not going to last. Rain working its way in from the northwest will work its way towards the southeast, and it remains changeable after that. All the details coming up shortly. And at quarter to eight, we'll take a look at the papers with the anthropologist Mariana Hotter and former editor of The Daily Star, Dawn Neeson. Good morning. Welcome to Sky News Breakfast. Thank you for joining us. The Metropolitan Police faces criticism from across the political spectrum this morning over its handling of a vigil for Sarah Everard, with Met Commissioner Cresta Dick urged to resign. Officers clashed with crowds who gathered on Clapham Common in South London in defiance of a police order. As police told people to go home, scuffles broke out and four arrests were made. Priti Patel and Sadiq Khan both say they've demanded an explanation from the Met. Ivor Bennett reports now on how a night that started peacefully descended into one of disorder. A warning, his piece contains flash photography. They are images that have caused outrage across the political spectrum. Seemingly passive protesters swarmed by dozens of officers and dragged away in handcuffs. One woman was even pinned to the floor. They were among hundreds who defied lockdown restrictions to attend a vigil in honour of Sarah Everard on Clapham Common, near to where the 33-year-old went missing. Four arrests were made, but it's the officers who are now in the spotlight. The Home Secretary, Priti Patel, called the scenes upsetting. She's asked the Metropolitan Police for a full report. London Mayor Sadiq Khan said it was unacceptable, while Liberal Democrat leader Sir Ed Davey called for Met Commissioner Cressida Dick to resign. Last night it was one of her assistants who faced the cameras and defended the police response. Officers on the ground were faced with a very difficult decision. Hundreds of people were tightly packed together, putting a, posing a very real risk of easily transmitting COVID-19. Police must act for people's safety. This is the only responsible thing to do. The pandemic is not over and gatherings of hundreds of people from right across London and beyond are still not safe. Police had urged people to stay at home after an official vigil was cancelled, but the local MP believes the violence wouldn't have happened had the original event been allowed. This is what happens when you restrict people's right to protest. People were, you know, looking to come together to hold a very decent uh, vigil, socially distanced, that would have been marshaled, that would have been protected. People would have dispersed within an hour. They would have been holding a minute's silence, um, you know, honouring Sarah, honouring all of the women that we've lost to violence, and they would have gone home. Earlier, the man charged with kidnapping and murdering Sarah Everard appeared at Westminster Magistrates Court arriving out of sight in a police van. 48-year-old Wayne Cousins will appear again at the Old Bailey on Tuesday. As well as remembering Sarah Everard, organisers of the vigil hoped it would shine a light on the issue of violence against women. 
While that was still done last night on doorsteps across the country, campaigners say they're not giving up on holding mass gatherings in the future. I will continue to have regular conversations with the Metropolitan Police and police up and down the country so women can hold events like this. And it is, it is our human right to ensure that we can gather peacefully. But in Clapham last night, a largely peaceful protest turned violent. And today, it's the police who are under scrutiny. Ivor Bennett, Sky News. Well, Milena Veselinovic is on Clapham Common in South London, where that vigil took place last night. And Milena, how have people been reflecting on, on what took place last night? Well, Gillian, since first light, people have been gathering at this makeshift memorial behind me, leaving flowers in memory of Sarah Everard and other victims of violence after a very emotional week erupted in those ugly scenes last night. The original vigil, which was due to be organised by a group called Reclaim These Streets, was cancelled because the police said that it breached lockdown restrictions, but nonetheless, people started arriving from early in the afternoon, including the Duchess of Cambridge, who took a few moments to reflect at the memorial. We know from the palace that this was because she remembered what it was like to walk the streets of London at night before she was married. But that sombre atmosphere really darkened as night fell and the police moved to try to disperse the gathering. They also prevented a few of the women from addressing the crowd from the bandstand and the mood turned angry. You could see images of police officers in some cases tackling the women to the ground, leading them away in handcuffs. Rather ugly scenes. We have heard from the police that they felt they had no choice but to enforce. There were four arrests for breaching lockdown as well as for public order offence but many have argued that in this mood of national outrage over the murder of Sarah Everard, they could have predicted that people would have come regardless of the restrictions, that perhaps would have been better to allow the original vigil to go ahead. Instead, we are left with these images of, uh, in some cases, male officers manhandling the women, not the kind of message you'd want to be sending in a week like this. OK, Milena, thank you. Let's speak now to our political correspondent, Rob Powell. And, Rob, politicians across the, the spectrum uh, seem to be united in their criticism of police tactics. Yeah, we have heard um, from um, all the various uh, parties. Um, not exactly criticism, I guess, from the government, Priti Patel, yet, uh, but saying that she wants um, more uh, information. She tweeted quite late last night saying that some of the footage circulating online from the vigil in Clapham is upsetting. I've asked the Metropolitan Police for a full report um, on, on what has happened. Now, the reason for that is that even during a lockdown, there's always a large degree uh, of operational flexibility and discretion that's given to police uh, on how to manage protests um, like this uh, and that's why there are questions over whether their response was heavy-handed. I think it was always going to be a very challenging situation for the Met to handle given the context of the pandemic and the stay-at-home um, order uh, and that some previous protests in London, anti-lockdown protests for instance, have been met um, with quite a firm response. But I think given the circumstances of Sarah Everard's um, recent death, the people are asking questions whether a similarly firm response uh, that has happened in the past was appropriate this time round, especially as for much of the time and for the overwhelming majority of people there anyway, this was a largely um, peaceful um, demonstration. I think another question, though, as Milena was raising there, is really going one step before um, last night uh, and asking whether the Met Police's apparent flat-out rejection of any kind of vigil um, was the right decision. Remember that court case on Friday, while it didn't allow a vigil, it didn't say that one was definitely lawful, it didn't completely close the door to it either. And I think given that the organisers um, were pretty open about how they wanted to take quite extensive steps to make it COVID secure, many will wonder whether it would have been a better idea to have an organised event rather than the more, ad, the, the more ad hoc event we had last night. I think potentially questions for the government, though, as well, about the lack of clarity um, when it comes to protests in the COVID rules. So questions for the Home Secretary, questions for the Mayor of London, who has ultimate responsibility for policing. But I think probably the biggest questions for the Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, Cresta Dick, who is facing some calls to resign this morning. Indeed. Rob, thank you very much for the moment. Maria Miller is a Conservative MP and former Minister for Women and Equality. She's also formerly chaired the Commons 
Women and Equalities Committee. John, just now, good morning to you. Um, I, I note that on Monday, on uh, International Women's Day, you opened the Commons debate and you said that we should not accept a culture of violence towards women, we should not be complicit in covering it up. The suggestion there that, that perhaps it, it is being covered up. Are, are we complicit in that? Uh, when you look at the data, it's really clear that most women don't report sexual harassment, yet it affects the vast majority of women in this country. And I think the Met Police really have to rethink their strategy for how they're handling this, uh, rather than telling women not to worry and stopping them speaking out. I think they need to start to listen to what the experiences of women in this country really are. In particular, what did you make of the, the handling of the uh, vigil last night, the police tactics used? Well, I think it was incredibly heavy handed and what was planned was a peaceful vigil and that could have allowed women to really show the outpouring of concern um, about the tragic death of Sarah Everard because it really um, speaks to their experiences as women, the sexual harassment being something that most women have to tackle on a regular basis. Um, so let's listen to women rather than trying to shut them up. Just to say, some of the images we might be showing do have a flash photography. Um, there have been calls for, at least one call, for the uh, Met Commissioner, Cresta Dick, to resign. Would you agree with that call? Do you think that she should resign over this? I think what she needs to do is to use her very extensive experience to get a much better approach to this. Um, this is a tragic situation, but to have the Met Police call it a rare occurrence and almost urge women to stop making such a big deal of it is, is just wrong. And it is a big deal. This affects women every day of the week. Um, and there are some really good examples of how other parts of the police have actually tackled this. So let's look at this positively as a way of trying to get change on a, an issue that really affects women's lives. Um, uh, as you say, p police, um, well, they have a degree of operational flexibility. What would you have liked to see yesterday instead of the scenes that some of the scenes that we're seeing and, and the arrests that, that were made? How could they have managed the situation a lot better? Oh, look, uh, as with many of the Black Lives Matters protests, which also happened during the pandemic, you know, the police were able to understand that people need to have uh, an opportunity to express their feelings. Uh, you know, we live in a country where we expect that as a matter of course. Uh, but I would also like to see the police really advocating for change on these things. Uh, the laws, some laws are there, some laws need changing. The data we collect is very poor. That needs to change. You know, let's work together on getting a better approach to sexual harassment and the sorts of things that were being protested about yesterday, uh, rather than getting ensnared in a situation where uh, we're trying to silence the real concern that the women have. We must remember that it didn't start out as a protest, started out as a, a vigil and Pretty Patel's calling for a full report into what actually happened. But the police were acting um, under her orders. Look, I think what we need to focus on is how we can move forward. And the, uh, Priti Patel has been very clear that uh, in her comments earlier that we do need to look at whether the laws need to be changed in, in, this, uh, in these sorts of circumstances where women experience sexual harassment. Should we be dealing with that differently? That's what we need to be focusing in on. Because after all, uh, the, the police can only police these sorts of situations of sexual harassment when uh, they have the right laws in place. So rather than, I think, focusing in on the protest what, uh, and the vigil, what I would like to see is a real focus on how we can support the police to do their job better to keep women safer. Maria Miller, thank you very much for speaking to us this morning. A Sky News investigation shows more than 600 children in the UK were arrested for suspected firearm offences last year. It includes children as young as 12 being detained by police for alleged gun crimes. David Mercer has the story. Kabir Kareem often returns to this street in West London. His 20-year-old brother Alex was shot dead here in June. Police believe Alex was killed in a case of mistaken identity. A 16-year-old boy was one of nine people arrested over his death. And eight months after Alex's funeral, no one has been charged. I'm able to come here. Sometimes I have to come here just to reflect. 
I feel almost coming here just to, you know, I think coming here is, it's the closest I've, I'll, I'll get to almost reliving him, him. And what, cause this was his last step, this was his last breath. You know, but like my mum, she, she can't handle it, honestly. The last time she came here, she was, she was hysterical. She was in tears, she was screaming, she was wailing in the street. The police in parts of the country are worried about gun crime and children are getting involved. Sky News can reveal more than 600 children were arrested for suspected firearm offences in the UK last year. The youngest was 12. Police figures obtained by Sky News show that 171 youths were detained by the Metropolitan Police for alleged firearm crimes in 2020. That was up from 165 the previous year. In the West Midlands, 86 children were arrested over firearms, among them two 12-year-old boys. And on Merseyside, a 14-year-old girl was arrested for a suspected firearm offence. Two years earlier, an 11-year-old was arrested there for a firearm crime. The West Midlands had some of the most alarming figures, and one former gang member who carried a gun when he was 15 has seen it coming. The real issue is it all really boils down to a way of thinking, a mindset and, and a culture, a culture that's been pushed and is thriving throughout um, the whole country. It started off in little communities like mine, but this mentality, this way of thinking is like a virus. It spreads. It started spreading throughout the school systems. I remember seeing it when I had just left school, started getting into um, gang violence and crime, and the, the way of thinking started to spread. It was just my community at first. Now it's Asian, it's the Asian community, it's the white community, it's everyone. The National Police Chiefs Council said overall gun crime in the UK remains low. It said it's working to break the cycle of young people becoming involved in gangs. Alex Kareem would have turned 21 this month. He planned to go to university to study computer science. His family believes someone out there knows who killed him. David Mercer, Sky News. The Prime Minister is set to outline plans to bolster Britain's cyber security next week. It follows a review of the government's foreign and defence policy. Boris Johnson will commit to take a full spectrum approach to cybercrime in a bid to keep people safe and stay ahead of the UK's enemies. He's set to announce plans for a cyber corridor across the north of England, where the headquarters of the new National Cyber Force will be based. Meanwhile, the Commons Defence Committee has criticised the British Army's ageing tank fleet, saying it could leave the UK outgunned and overmatched in a conflict with Russian forces. In a new report, the group of MPs says a series of procurement failures has left the army with some military vehicles dating back to the early 1960s. I fear there's been too much of a perhaps a lure towards the digital domain, towards cyber security, towards you know, the space command and so forth. And, but we, you know, we drop our guard from the conventional side at our peril. And yet this is exactly what I see this integrated review taking us to. The NHS is to text millions of vulnerable people with underlying health conditions, asking them to take up a coronavirus vaccine. The health service will send out around 2 million messages this weekend to people with conditions such as diabetes and certain cancers. Let's take a look at the latest coronavirus figures now. And 5,534 new cases were recorded in the latest 24-hour period, with another 121 deaths. That takes the total number of people who've died to 125,464. The figures also show that 23.68 million people have now received a first dose of a coronavirus vaccine. Look forward to brighter skies. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Hello there, good morning to you. Well, we've actually got the sun coming through the window here at Sky this morning. It's absolutely glorious. Uh, it's not going to last, though. Uh, these things don't at the moment. It's all rather changeable. And it's not just us, it's all of Northern Europe as well. So uh, a low pressure to the north of us, more rain making its way in, and this is going to work its way from the northwest down towards the southeast. So first thing this morning, as I say, plenty of sunshine for central and eastern parts. It looks absolutely glorious. It is quite chilly out there, though, and throughout the day it is going to be windy. So whatever the
the temperatures are, it's going to feel colder anyway. Already showers over western parts, rain over western parts of Ireland, worked its way into western parts of Scotland, northern parts of Wales by the middle of the day. Temperatures between 10 and 12 degrees Celsius, that's 54 degrees Fahrenheit. And then through the afternoon, that rain makes its way into the Midlands, East Anglia, down into the southeast as well. And the sky is bright across Scotland and northern Ireland, leaving a mixture of sunny spells and scattered showers. And then through this evening and overnight, it becomes dry, so another bright start to Monday morning. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Still to come, we have all the sport with Jackie. The rugby was good, wasn't it? It was really exciting, wasn't it? Depending on which side of the fence you fall, yeah. but, you know, it's pretty much Wales in the driving seat, but we're going to tell you why Mario Toji's late try against France will have been cheered by England and Wales fans in the Six Nations. Plus, champions calling Manchester City might just have one hand on the Premier League title after another clinical display last night. And it's all smiles from Lee Westwood, who is one round away from what could be one of the biggest wins of his career. Me and my friend Rob, uh, we decided we would set ourselves this challenge to swim in the sea for 365 days without wetsuits, raising money and awareness for local uh, charities and community projects, Shoalstone Seawater Pool, and also the Seal Project, which is a, a local conservation project. Um, it's Rob's idea, to be honest. He invited me for a swim uh, back in 2019. Uh, one day turned into two, to a week, to a month, before you know it. We were swimming for an entire year. In the winter months, it does get a bit, a bit windy and a bit cold. But ultimately, we was uh, we was committed, um, and we was, uh, you know, very very keen to, to do every single day and uh, raise that money and awareness. So um, to be fair, once we was into it, it wasn't a problem. And uh, the sort of adventure and the things we get to see are just breathtaking. This is a a, um, a spider crab sort of uh, molt they come into the bay once a year in their thousands tens of thousands uh, and they pile up they come into molt so they they uh, remove their shells uh, and they mate and then they go again so it's probably about a few weeks you get this sort of mass of spider crabs uh, we see regularly see um seals because uh, it's a seal habitat where we live um but this is a sort of uh, it's quite rare, these kind of encounters, especially with the seals. Um, although we do uh, live and swim in a seal habitat, they um, they rarely come up to you. This is, uh, you know, these are very rare occasions. But we set up the challenge for uh, for other people to do, and that's the, the whole sort of point of it now, really. Um, we're now a community interest company, and we're looking to recruit more sea swimmers and wild swimmers who want to give it back to their communities, raise a bit of money for their charities uh, and also help us out as well. Jackie is here with all the sport. One name, Mario Toji, hero. <laughs> you love Mario Toji. I love Mario Toji. You know I love Mario Toji. I think England fans do love him too as well. <laughs> yeah, we're going to be talking Six Nations. Um, also, um, tribute still continuing to pour in for Murray Walker, the voice of F1. And uh, speaking of in the driving seat, Lee Westwood, he very much is at the Players' Championship. Let's have a look. This sports bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Committed to getting 100 million people 20% more active by 2025.
Is this the future? With its rush of air, crunch of gravel and electric wine, Extreme E sounds and looks like nothing else and is progressive enough and competitive enough to hook Jensen Button as a team owner. Button, who not so long ago seemed an electric sceptic. If I'd said to you five years ago you'd be racing in an electric series, would you have laughed at me? Look at it. It's, it's so cool. It's so exciting. You know, this is an electric vehicle that has 550 horsepower. Initially, we ran it 60% power. I was thinking, it's not very quick. Uh, and then we turn it up to 100, and wow. The series' five rounds will be held at global sites relevant to climate change, from oil-rich Saudi Arabia to a worryingly ever-greener Greenland. But to maximise the messaging on global warming, must the racing be red-hot and, like the eco-science content running in tandem, easy to follow. The format's going to be really short races. You know, our attention span these days is not great. I mean, we're doing an interview here and neither of us are on our phones, which is unusual. Um, we're going to be racing in places around the world that no one's really ever um, put a foot down on, on, on the sand or on the dirt. So for us, it's an amazing experience. Extreme E enjoys relevance to the growing electric road car market. But unlike Formula E, a series button declined to join, avoids unfavourable comparisons with F1. Perhaps as a result, it's attracted three F1 world champion owners, with Nico Rosberg and Button's fellow Briton Sir Lewis Hamilton also signed up. Well, Sebastian Loeb is in Lewis Hamilton's car. So I think Lewis's team is pretty strong and Nico Rosberg has a team as well. So um, it's F1 World Champions re re you know, reuniting. In terms of its purpose, format and presentation, Extreme E is different. Will it create a buzz? <laughs> Craig Slater, Sky Sports. I'm in. I'm in. I'm in. We're all in to kick it out. Partnering to end racism in sport. I'm Errol McKellar, and I've been a football youth coach and mentor for over 40 years. We're at the training ground for the Leighton Orient youth team. I've been very privileged to work with some really, really fantastic footballers, the likes of Sol Campbell, Ashley Cole, Ledley King, but when they're passionate and they're good at what they're doing, your job is not that difficult. All you've got to do is keep enhancing and working with their dreams. If we don't make them become footballers, we make them become better people. Trust these guys, right? they will get you there. Thank you, guys. I wasn't always a football coach. I started off as a mechanic. That was my day-to-day -day job. You know, everything was fine until I was diagnosed with prostate cancer. I found out about prostate cancer purely by accident. When my wife Sharon was complaining about me snoring, I went to the doctor, I picked up a leaflet from Prostate Cancer UK, and the young lady said, you don't need to make an appointment. This is a simple blood test that takes less than 10 minutes. I get a phone call, could I come in and have a biopsy done? Moving on from that, I had a scan, and the doctor said, Mr. McKellar, your prostate is covered in cancer. If we don't remove your prostate, you could be dead in six months. And I remember sitting in my car, I just burst into tears because I didn't know what to do next. And my wife came in the car and she said, look, in all the years that I've been with you, I've never seen you quit on anything that you've ever done. She said, this cancer has only knocked you down. It hasn't knocked you out. And I took that as an inspiration. So I had the operation to remove the prostate. I had to have nearly three months of radiotherapy to get rid of the rest of the cancer. The first day I went back into my garage, a gentleman came in to have some work done on his car. And I said, um, when was the last time you had your prostate checked? And he said, what the bleep, bleep, bleep has that got to do with my gearbox not working? And I said to him, listen, I'll give you a 20% discount on the work I'm gonna do on your car if you go and get your prostate checked. Two weeks later, he came back. He had a 25% cancer in his prostate. He said to me, look, don't worry about the money. More importantly, I think you need to start raising the awareness of this issue, right? because I wouldn't have gone and done this check had you not. Committed to getting 100 million people 20% more active by 2025.
This is Sky News Breakfast coming up. The 12 year old from Wiltshire who's been undertaking a keepy uppy challenge to raise money for the NHS. Welcome back to Sky News Breakfast. Sky News understands that the Metropolitan Police has launched a preliminary investigation into Asma al-Assad, the British-born wife of Syrian President Bashar al-Assad, is accused of supporting and encouraging terrorism. If charged, it could pave the way for the Met to seek her extradition. This month marks 10 years since the start of the war in Syria, which has left an estimated 400,000 people dead and more than 6.5 million others displaced. Sadia Chowdhury reports. London-born Asma al-Assad may have seemed out of place in Syria when she first married one of the Arab world's strongmen. I was born and raised in London. I know the central line extremely well, whether it was going to school, going to university. But over time, the former investment banker and wife of President Bashar al-Assad has cemented her position as one of the most powerful people in the country. Now Sky News understands an investigation in her birth town could lead to charges that she supported and encouraged terrorism. Bashar al-Assad has denied war crimes and says instead he has been fighting terrorists. British lawyers say the Syrian government is guilty of a systematic approach to the torture and murder of civilians, including with the use of chemical weapons. And that Asma al-Assad is among a number of influential actors that have encouraged and incited acts of terrorism and international crimes. Theoretically, 
if the Metropolitan Police agree with that which has been submitted and further evidence that they may uncover during their own investigation, then they can seek to bring charges and they can seek to extradite her to the UK. In a statement, the Metropolitan Police Service told Sky News, we can confirm that the Met's War Crimes Unit, part of the Counter-Terrorism Command, received a referral on 31st of July 2020 relating to the ongoing Syrian conflict. The referral is in the process of being assessed by officers from the War Crimes Unit. Former friends of the couple say her influence is growing, with reports she has political ambitions to climb to the very top. You cannot compare uh, the existing Asma al-Asad uh, al to the previous virgin, which is Emma al-Akhras in London. Till now, when she succeeded to consolidate a lot of power, now she's number one in, in economy in Syria and the one that run all the development about administration and economy. Last year, she was sanctioned by the US government. Despite this, Asma al-Assad's influence doesn't appear to be wavering. But how she uses that power is now under scrutiny. Sadia Chowdhury, Sky News. Now, many of us uh, will have taken up new hobbies in the past year to break up the monotony of lockdown. For one football-loving 12-year-old from Wiltshire, that new hobby was keepy uppies, which he's used to raise money for the NHS. Alfie Pavlat walsh and his mum, Amy Ireland, join me now. Welcome to you both. Um, I can see that you've got the ball at the ready, <laughs> ready to start those keepy uppies for us. Um, Alfie, can you tell us... Before we get into the football, what, what life, how would you compare life before the pandemic and after the pandemic? How, how did you find that the change in, in your situation? Before lockdown, I was doing like lots of football sessions every night. And then when lockdown came, I started like having nothing to do and I was getting bored. So then I just started practicing key parts. And Amy, what, what sort of changes did you see in Alfie during the, the, the lockdown? Yeah, he was um, he was super excited to start with, obviously, uh, sort of being off school. Um, and then he sort of mentally quite struggled, like struggled quite a lot because he is always at, he's never at home, never at home. He does football six days a week. So every evening we're out at the weekends, we're out. And then he was, you know, 24 seven at home. And he, he really, really struggled with that. Alfie, you must have been so bored. So then where did the idea come from to, to raise some money for the NHS via Keepy Uppies? It kind of just, like, the NHS was struggling and I've seen other people been setting themselves challenges to raise money. So I thought I'd just give it a go. It came up with Keepy Ups. Shall I set you a challenge and see if you can do Keepy Uppies for the rest of this interview while speaking? <laughs> what do you reckon? Are you up for the challenge? All right, <laughs> let's go for it. Right, next question to you then, Mum. Um, so this was all set up on Instagram, um, which obviously Alfie isn't old enough to use. So you've set that, that up on Instagram. And what sort of um, reception did that receive? Yeah, it was really, really good. There's a lot of children in a similar situation to Alfie. Um, so it was kind of connecting with other, you know, youth football players, futsal players, um, there were a lot of uh, sort of giveaways and sessions that he could do online from that. Um, and it just built built the community, like a big community, really. There's some really fantastic players out there. Um, and Alfie's learned a lot from them and it's really kept them busy, I guess, over, over the lockdown periods. Let's see if Alfie can talk and keep doing that. And Alfie, how much money did you raise for the NHS? £1,250. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Well done, well done. Um, and so you've raised this money for the NHS. Um, you set this up on Instagram. But, Amy, you had to, to manage the account. Unfortunately, you, you know, encountered some, some issues with that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've, we've sort of had some quite indecent messages, not from children, but from adults. Um, and it just it sort of opened my eyes to how serious sort of the internet safety aspect of things is and we've shared all the information with Alfie you know we've told him about these messages and things because obviously he is in a couple of weeks going to be old enough to sort of have his own accounts and things um, and he's got access to the account so there's always a chance that he could see it and so we've had these conversations about you know internet safety um, we've even had to get the police involved in some of them the local police have been oh, yeah. fantastic uh, but it just, it sort of really opened our eyes to it and also to Alfie's friends because he can then share 
you know, his experiences with those as well. Yeah, no, it is really worrying. You do have to be so vigilant, don't you? Um, Alfie, yeah. what are your aspirations for your future footballing career? What are you hoping to achieve? Apart from keeping I'm hoping to be a yeah. professional footballer. If not, I'm going to try and be a freestyler. What was that? I missed that. When I'm older, I want to be a professional footballer. If I don't quite make it, I want to be a freestyler. Right. Professional footballer. And who do you support now? What team? Liverpool. Liverpool. Yeah, I can, I can manage that. Always oh, still keeping the ball up in the air. Alfie, keep going. Thank you so much for speaking to us this morning. Uh, Alfie and uh, Amy, good to see you. And uh, keep that ball in the air. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Cheers. He's still going. Now... Even as the number of deaths from COVID-19 falls, medical staff are still coping with huge and changing demands on services. The air ambulance crew in Northern Ireland has told Sky News that uh, since lockdown, it's brought a surge in life-threatening injuries caused by mental illness. Our senior island correspondent, David Blevins, went out with the service. This wasn't staged for the cameras. Northern Ireland's Air Ambulance is responding to a live call. The crew's mission, as always, is to preserve life. Minutes later, they're putting this training into practice, intubating a patient. OK, folks, so just a recap of where we are. Obviously, we've extricated this patient. He's fallen 20 feet. Every day begins with this kind of exercise, and PPE has brought unique challenges. Well, one of the biggest challenges is communication. You know, I'm talking to you tonight with normal tone and voice, but we had to raise that up, you know, whenever we're speaking. And particularly in an aircraft, we're wearing our helmets, we're wearing these masks. So I'm talking to the pilot, talking to the doctor, and sometimes you've got to um, speak louder and are really reliant upon effective communication. Ems call. Ems call in Belfast. Stand by for details. It isn't long before they're doing it for real. Ambulance headquarters in Belfast is requesting the Helicopter Emergency Medical Service. They quickly deploy from their base, formerly the site of Northern Ireland's notorious Mays Prison. From this place long associated with death, they are saving life. But the pandemic poses a real threat in the confined space of an aircraft. Within five minutes of the 999 call, this crew can be on board and ready for departure. But it doesn't matter what kind of incident they're responding to, they now have to assume that every patient is COVID positive. COVID has increased the number of incidents. They're keen to ease the pressure on their land colleagues. Rooftop landings at the Royal Victoria Hospital have become routine. But increased isolation during lockdown has changed the nature of calls. They're dealing with an upsurge in life-threatening injuries caused by attempted suicide. A variety of traumatic injuries that are a result of mental health and, and the stresses of society dealing with the COVID pandemic. Um, we are able to, to bring interventions, airway secure, ongoing CPR if, you know, for, for prolonged arrests. And it's certainly probably one of the stark things I've noticed whilst there's maybe been a dip in some of the road traffic collisions that we attend. They're not the front line in the fight against COVID. They're a critical back line. Trauma doesn't stop during a pandemic. Tomorrow will bring different challenges for Northern Ireland's air ambulance team. David Blevins, Sky News, at the maze. And if you find you're struggling with some of the same feelings covered in our report, you can contact the Samaritans for help. Their telephone number and email is at the bottom of the screen for you now. Time now for a look at the weather with Joe. Look forward to brighter skies. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Hello there, good morning to you. Probably best to look at this morning's weather rather than this afternoon's weather. It's certainly the better part of the day. For everybody this morning, it's a mostly dry and bright start with some bright or sunny spells. There are just one or two showers around western coasts and some rain making its way into western parts of Ireland. And this is going to be the fly-in ointment through the day. 
So the rain makes its way into western parts of Scotland, across Northern Ireland, into northern parts of Wales by the middle of the day, and then presses on down into uh, the Midlands and out towards the southeast and East Anglia by this evening. Temperatures today, 11 or 12 degrees Celsius, 54 degrees Fahrenheit. It will be windy everywhere, but the sky is brightening up towards the north and the west later, and overnight it becomes dry. Tomorrow will be dry, bright and fine again. The Weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. It's 7.44, you're watching Sky News at Breakfast, still to come. We'll take a look at the newspapers with the anthropologist Mariana Hotter and former editor of The Daily Star, Dawn Leeson. Do stay with us. This is good technology, which has been around for a few years, but hasn't been very widely used. And what we'd like to do is to roll it out much faster. We're planning to um, test 11,000 people over the next year or so across England to see whether they have the early signs of bowel cancer or to give them the all clear. And obviously, the NHS has been under huge pressure during the pandemic. We've got lists of people waiting for colonoscopies. We diagnose more than 100 people a day with bowel cancer. And we have to test many times that with a colonoscopy usually. So this is one way to help take some of the pressure off those waiting lists uh, at the same time as bringing in a technology which is potentially much more convenient for patients, of course. They come through in a few days. You have to analyze the images that come off the recorder that people wear when they take the pill. Um, but then they come through very quickly indeed. We have, we have people trained to read the images that come from the capsule. Uh, they produce a report and those then go back to the patient very quickly. So it's a, it's a very straightforward way of looking for things like polyps in the bowel or early cancers. And of course, that's what we want is to be able to catch cancer at an early stage when it's most curable. Um, it's really just for cancers in the bowel. Uh, it will, of course, examine the other parts of the intestine as it passes through. And in fact, I had a, a patient come to me the other day who'd had one of these capsules who had a tumour in their small intestine, which is, which is much less common. But generally speaking, the main thing we're using it for is, is to look for bowel cancer. <laughs> is a forgotten front line. They are dying here. Here it comes. Cut. Boy, we've got some interesting ways of showing you what's going on. Their message to us, get ready. Nothing like a Instructing you to stay at home. I can't believe we did that. It's pretty special, isn't it? I'm Siobhan Robbins, Sky Southeast Asia correspondent in Bangkok. We take you to the heart of the stories that shape our world. that air pollution isn't just bad for the environment, it's bad for our health too. It'll be a chilly start for many parts of the country with some good sunny spells. Just a few showers over western coasts, but later on we'll see cloud increasing in the northwest, bringing rain to western Scotland, northern Ireland, and then that will travel its way southeastwards to reach East Anglia and the far southeast by evening. Clearer skies will follow with just a few showers, and it will be windy throughout the day. Those winds quite strong and gusty at times. However, these continuing unsettled conditions do mean that air pollution is likely to remain low. The Air Quality Report, sponsored by Philips Air Purifiers. With us now to take us through the newspapers once again, the anthropologist Mariana Hotter and the former editor of the Daily Star, Dawn Neeson. Welcome back to you. Uh, let's start with the mail uh, front page. And uh, Dawn, you've had a look at this story. Um, talking about the rules recruiting um, a legal firm, this is 
to help, presumably, with their um, domestic affairs, the, 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 the rows that we've seen? Indeed, Gillian. Uh, this is the ongoing fallout from Oprah Winfrey's interview with Meghan and Harry, which most people saw last week, and some shocking allegations um, revealed in that. However, this is also um, now about the bullying allegations that have recently been made about Meghan by members of staff, um, which Buckingham Palace have now announced they are bringing in an external independent legal firm to carry out a, the, an investigation of these allegations. Um, the Duchess of Sussex, it has to be said, has also got um, her people to request to um, be see sight of the allegations, the emails, the letters, the complaints against her. So it does sound like this is not going away anytime soon. Um, and, you know, your, your heart goes out to the Queen who, you know, with her husband in hospital and with, she's 94, with everything else going on, um, this is the, the, the last thing she needs. However, like any complaint of bullying, it has to be properly investigated now. So, you know, it's, it's a sure, good does thing. Does not go out to, to Meghan, who's had these claims made against her um, and she's pregnant at the moment do you not feel any sympathy course, towards her absolutely, absolutely it's it's this is not good on either side Julian it's an incredibly stressful situation um it's it, it just seems to be getting worse on a daily basis now you know you, you you feel for everybody involved um but these claims have to be investigated and you know in a way the fact that an independent legal firm has been brought in to carry it out Hopefully, we'll see some closure on on this this awful, basically a family mess, isn't it? They might be the royal family, but it's still family. It's a family that really are being ripped apart by this. Yeah, no, no, um, ugly. However, you look at it. To the mm -hmm. Times, uh, Marianne, and the voluntary services overseas are, are cutting their their work with the the UK. Tell us about this story. Yeah, that's right. So the Voluntary Services Overseas, the VSO, has is a charity that's been around for, for 50 odd years. And um, often they uh, help people from um, underrepresented or deprived backgrounds have an experience of being effectively a kind of a world citizen um, or an international citizen. And through that, effectively are promoting um the, the values and the principles that we uphold in the UK, in British um, life, and, and genuinely helping um, people in countries where um, they've got, you know, development um, goals. So their budget is about £42 million. And up until this year, they've relied on about half of uh, that coming from the uh, what is now the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, so the FCDO. And the FCDO have now said, well, foreign aid budget is being cut. Uh, we need to look after our own first. So we're not going to spend as much money on international development, on foreign, foreign aid. Um, so they've uh, they basically said that we can't guarantee funding to the VSO after the 31st of March. And so the VSO have said, basically, we're now facing a cliff edge. We can't operate with half of our budget. So they'd wind down UK operations. They'd withdraw from um, uh, like 14 countries. They'd have to make 200 people redundant. And I just think this is an absolute travesty. We can't allow, really, the government to sort of say, oh, well, you know, we've got a pandemic to sort out. because Organisations like the VSO are built on experience and authority and trust that they've built up with their partner organisations in yeah. countries around the world. And they do such uh, wonderful work. I, I remember being taught by yeah. a VSO teacher how to swim out in the, the Caribbean of all places. Um, yeah, so uh, great organisation, great charity. Let's have a look at um, this story in The Times. Dawn, you've had a look at this. Um, uh, database, dangerous men on a, a database. I haven't got the exact article here. Fill us in. It's right. OK, well, this, as you say, Julian, is in the Times. The ministers are considering plans for a national register to um, create a super database that would log details of the estimated 50,000 men convicted annually of offences, including harassment, coercive control and stalking against women. Um, and this has to be a good thing, surely. Um, at the moment... That we, we need to move on from this, this appalling murder of Sarah Everard. And if we can do anything positive to encourage women to come forward to report crimes, assault, 
sexual assault, even domestic violence against men. Um, it has to, because women so at the moment are so wary of coming forward because they feel they're not being listened to by the authorities. And if there is a database, surely any woman's going to think, right, OK, well, I can get this person registered so it might protect other women from being attacked in the sort of man. It's actually going to be modelled on the Sex Offenders Register, which is established in 1997, and that holds information about those cautioned, convicted and released from prison for sexual offences against children. And it's under a full disclosure scheme at Sarah's Law, remember our um, Sarah Payne, the eight-year-old murder victim. Um, you can go there and you can find out if, if somebody has been convicted of these crimes. And I think, what is? why shouldn't we have a database of, of, of men who have assaulted and attacked yeah. women? It surely yeah. makes sense. It does sound like common sense. Uh, very quickly, Marianne, tell us about uh, green chocolate eggs in time for Easter. They sound yummy. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, basically, um, a lot of brands have responded to increased consumer demand around uh, basically using less single-use plastic. So, you know, you used to get Easter eggs in massive boxes with all sorts of crappy plastic toys and plastic packaging and casing and stuff. There. They're basically... But now they're green and that, not actually the colour green, but they're environmentally friendly. Thank you both for taking us through the papers, Dawn and Marianne. Good to see you. Thank you.